cool was is because he was the organizer. He uh, constructed it, wrote the first version of the labs, I think, and yeah. uh, all sorts, and uh, gave his classical talk on kernel design. So Nicola, um, well, he's a, uh, he actually is perfect for this school because he's a uh, PhD with David uh, Gansbourget, who's sort of an expert in uh, this uncertainty quantification area, one of the leading people trying to bridge between machine learning stats and uncertainty quantification. Um, and then he came to do a postdoc here with uh, Jeremy yeah. uh, initially, so who you heard from as a second talk, and then myself. And now he's a, uh, what, what, what's your position title? It's a uh, uh, lecturer, associate professor. Associate kind of professor uh, at the Ecole de Mines Saint Etienne. Um, he also has this very interesting background in that he understands Gaussian process methods are closely related to methods in Colonel Hilbert spaces. And uh, his original background was sort of in that approach. So he's the perfect person to talk about, uh, introduce different styles of covariance function, their motivation, and their construction. Um, which, as you should be getting the idea now, that's the key to modeling with a Gaussian process. It's a mechanical process. All the design goes into the kernel. So the kernel design is critical. <laughs> Thank you very much. So to finish the day, we are going to, to see these few these few things, so I will really talk about kernels, and so what I mean by kernel is, is covariance functions, and how to choose kernels, and how you can tweak kernels. So that's, and I'll finish by, uh, by an, an application, which is something I've been working on when I was doing my, my postdoc in, in Niels group. So, the, um, the, the thing you, you've seen with uh, Neil and Jeremy is that if you want to specify uh, distribution of a Gaussian process, you have to specify both a mean function and a covariance function that is a function of two variables. The, it's kind of equivalent when, you're, when you have a Gaussian random variable, it's defined by one scalar that is the mean and one positive scalar that is the variance, right? If you have a Gaussian vector, its distribution is defined by a vector for the mean and a covariance matrix for uh, the covariance. And for a GP, you have a mean that is a function and the covariance that is a function of two variables. Okay, it's kind of the generalization of a Gaussian vector. So this is the one we are going to look at, the covariance. So before talking about covariance, I'm going to make a third introduction to GPs with a slightly different point of view. It's just a few slides, don't, don't worry. So we assume we have a few observation points and, um, and okay, so if I were to ask you what is the value of my function around the year, I'm pretty sure you would answer a, a value, no, I, I don't know, somewhere in this range. Okay, I'm not exactly sure about this value, but when I see these points, I can guess that the value should be around here. If you make this guess, this is because you assume some regularity for the function you want to approximate. You say, oh, I can see something quite smooth going through there, so I can predict this value. If you don't assume anything about the regularity of the function you want to approximate, so if you say, oh, it's, let's say, the worst case ever, it's discontinuous, this is just, this is just coming from white noise, then you basically can't predict anything in there because it's not related to the data, okay? So if you want to do some model, you have observations, but you have to put some information in your model, and the information you put is the prior you're using when you're building the model. So. As Neil and Jeremy explained this morning, one good way to use, to put priors is to describe what you think about the, um, about the function you want to approximate by a Gaussian process. So a Gaussian process is just an infinite collection of functions, and you can imagine like something for a Gaussian process is you roll a dice and you'll obtain one of these functions, but you have an infinite number of functions, all right? So now what happens if you want to combine the two informations we have? So we have, on the one hand, we have this data, and on the other hand, we have this prior we think for, for the function. What would happen if you want to, to combine both? For example, can we assume our function is one of these? Can our function be this one? No, because I have an observation around 0.8, and the observation is around there. So it can't be this one, so I can remove this. And you can basically, among this infinite set, you can remove all those that do not go through your data points, okay? And this is what you obtain. So that's another way to look at what is the conditional distribution of a Gaussian process. You have a, a huge family of function, and you remove all of them that are not satisfying your, your constraints. 
So in practice, you really don't want to obtain these conditional samples. You really don't want to start sampling a lot and rejecting the ones that do not go through the point. Because ac actually, if you, if you look at the value here, you will never find one that goes exactly through the point. Right? So it's not the right way to simulate conditional sample path. But it's a good way to kind of understand what a conditional Gaussian process is. Uh, so this is more for introducing the, the notations, the mean functions, and the covariance they write as matrix product. And so I will write on the top that k of the lowercase x and uppercase x will be the covariance between the process at the point x we want to predict and the, all the points we have already observed. Right? So the first term will be a product between uh, a vector the inverse of the covariance matrix and the vector of the observations. Right? So this is what we obtain as the summary for our model with the mean value of our conditional samples and some 95% confidence intervals. Right? So we say in this point, 95% of the conditional samples will be into this range. All right? So now let's talk a bit more about kernel. So if we look at this expression, we can see kernels appear everywhere. We have the products are product between covariances, and our kernel is the object that describes the covariances. So you can really tell that it will be a very important object in here. So wh what can we say? The first thing we can say is that the value of a kernel, in if you evaluate it twice at the same point, this will be positive. Why? Because the kernel at xx is a covariance between the same object twice. So this is a variance, and we know that variance is positive. Right? The other thing we can tell directly is that the kernel will be symmetric. If, since the covariance operator is something that is symmetric, the covariance between x and y is equal to the covariance between y and x, then we can see that k inherits from its property. Right? Uh, actually, we can obtain a thinner result, which is that a kernel is positive semi-definite. So it means that basically we have this equality that stands whatever the uh, size of the... Um, so here, uh, I, I should have write everything. I sum from i equal to 1 to n, j equal to 1 to n, and I sum this quantity. So whatever the value n I choose, whatever the coefficients AI I choose, and whatever the points XI I choose, this quantity must be positive. So it must be positive because this quantity can be interpreted as a variance. This is the variance of the sum and we know that a variance is positive. Okay? The detail of, of the calculations is is right there. So, question? yeah. Quick question. So, is it not positive or but non negative? So, why is zero okay? Yeah, so a variance can be equal to zero, right? Does it make sense in, in this framework? That you? So, k equals to zero is okay to use? Yeah. You, you, you can have uh, you, you can have kernel that, well, uh, actually, most of the, or maybe all the kernels, uh, you can have the equality equal to zero. Okay, a very simple example, if you build a covariance matrix where one of the points x is repeated twice, for example. If you do a very simple covariance with twice the same point. Okay, you will obtain a matrix. Okay, we can, we can do that. We have x1 and x2 that are exactly located at the same point. Now, if you compute the covariance matrix, so we have x equal to x1, x2. Now, if I compute the covariance matrix between x and, uh, yeah, or maybe, no, I will not do it like that. I will use directly this, um, this definition. So here I have z of x1 and z of x2 that are located at the exact same location. Okay. So if I choose ai equal to 1, a2 equal to minus 1, if I do 
this computation I will end up with zero. Okay, so that all the covariance structure can have a zero in there. What happens if we have a zero in there? It that's when you if we come back to this definition, this matrix here, you cannot invert it anymore. All right, but you can replace this inverse actually by a pseudo inverse, and then do all the computations. So people usually don't worry much about this case, but it would be kind of more proper to write always this with a pseudo inverse inside of instead of, of an inverse. All right? Any other question? Okay. So so yeah, so a kernel has uh, this property to be positive semi-definite. It's very related to the property of mm, positive, when we say a matrix is positive semi-definite, it's something very similar. It, this is kind of the generalization of this concept to functions instead of just for matrix. So for a matrix, it will mean that all the eigenvalues are positive. And I think that's something you've looked at during, during the lab, right? So we've seen that if k is a covariance, we prove that it has to be symmetric and it has to be positive semi-definite, right? The opposite is also true. If you have a positive semi-definite function, then you can use that, you can see that as the covariance of a Gaussian process. You can build a Gaussian process that will have this, this uh, kernel. So there are uh, many kernels. I think you've been playing with some of them during, during the lab, probably the squared exponential and the Matern kernel exponential. And uh, some of the kernels, I think the white noise, you, I've also seen that on some of your screens. So OK, there are, there are many, many kernels. What we can see in these uh, two things. The first one is many kernels write as a difference of x minus y. These kernels are called stationary kernels. It means that if you move inside the space, then your covariance will be the same. All right? it's not, it does not change. It just depends on the distance, on the difference between x and y. Okay. And uh, another thing is we often include parameters into, into these kernels. You can see here the first one, sigma square, that is uh, called the variance. It's called the variance because for most kernel, it corresponds to the variance of your Gaussian process in one point x. Uh, and the other one, which is the, the length scale. So the variance can be interpreted as a rescaling of the y-axis. If you increase the variance, it just means that your process will have variations that goes, uh, that have more amplitude than a process with a small variance. Okay, so it's just a rescaling of, of the vertical axis. If you look at the length scale, the length scale always divides x and y. So the length scale is a rescaling of the horizontal axis. Okay, so if you have a large length scale, it, it means you stretch your space like that. If you have a small length scale, you kind of compress your your space. So, okay. Yeah. Which ones are, are they all, sta all stationary? No, if you look at them, the, four, the one that right has a difference are stationary. So the first four one are stationary. The kernel of the Brownian motion is not stationary. For example, the, the minimum is not a function of the difference. Uh, the white noise is stationary. The constant one is stationary. It's a bit generated, right, but it's stationary. And the linear kernel is not. Yeah? Uh, I'm sorry, say it again. No. No, no, large length scale makes a. So, so I, I, can, I can illustrate that. So uh, that's, yeah. Uh, OK, so that's something where you have here. You can choose your, your covariance function. And the covariance function is plotted right here. So on the left, you have the mean function. Here, I choose the mean to be equal to 0. And here you have a plot of the covariance function. The covariance function is a function of two parameters. So I set one of them to be equal to 0 0.5. And then I plot that as a function of the other parameter. So you can see if I reduce the length scale, then the covariance decays much faster. Okay? And if I increase it, the covariance decays slower. So if, you look at, if we look at the sample path, 
from here, again, if I reduce the length scale, it becomes more wiggly. OK, this is a bit of an extreme case, but more wiggly. If I change the variance parameters, I'll come to, to this one. If I change the variance parameter, you have to look at the y-axis here. If I increase this one, then you, you can see it's just the vertical amplitude. And if you look, oops, sorry. If you look at the associated sample path in here, again, if I increase the variance, then here the it's just they have a more amplitude, right? So um, this is true for the, uh, this is a Matten 5 half covariance functions, but you can look at other covariance functions. Here's, for example, the exponential covariance function. So you can see it has, it's not differentiable in here. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a sharp spike compared to the other one. And you can have more and more regular covariance function by going to the Matten 5 half, so on, and until having to, the squared exponential one that is uh, that will be infinitely differentiable, right? So if you look at the sample from this one, the sample will also be infinitely differentiable. They will be very very smooth. Okay. So by changing the kernel, we change the prior belief we we have. Uh, if you want to access that to to play with it, you can go on my GitHub uh, page. And this is a shiny app, so if you, you if you have R, you can run that with uh, with R. Okay, it will open in your in your browser. Uh, okay, so that's a plot of uh, some of the covariance functions that are available in in GPy. So you can see they can have very different shapes. So the one on the top are maybe the, the most common. The Brownian is also historically very very important, but yeah, you can see there's a huge difference between this one and, and the one above. And you can see this one is not uh, is not stationary. Uh, some linear kernel. Uh, some of you may be familiar with splines, so thin spline or cubic splines that can also be interpreted as Gaussian processes. It's just a special covariance function that will return you these these models. Uh, these are periodic covariance functions. For example, if you if you sample with these, your, your sample will also be periodic. And that's the one of the, of the white noise. So if you know that your kernel is stationary, there are a few things that, uh, that you can guarantee. So if your uh, kernel is differentiable in 0, then it has to be differentiable everywhere. So for example, this cannot be a valid covariance function, because if it's not differentiable, like the exponential kernel, the non-differentiability is in 0, but not elsewhere. Uh, if it's, um, yeah, if it's uh, discontinuous, it has to be discontinuous in 0. And uh, the maximum has to be reached in 0 and not, and not elsewhere. So for example, these three functions cannot be stationary covariance functions. Okay. So for a few kernel, you can show that they are positive definite directly using the, the definition. So for example, if we take the first one, so the covariance of the white noise. We have for, a, for all n, for all ai, for all xi, what can we say about this double sum? If I plug in here the covariance function of the white noise, so the covariance function of the white noise is the covariance function that is like that. It, it's equal to zero everywhere. So Let's say I have one value y here. I plot that as a function of x. So it's equal to 0 everywhere, except when x equal to y, which is when it's equal to sigma square. OK? So what happened to this double sum if this one is the white noise kernel? All the terms that are for which i is not equal to j will be equal to 0, right? 
So this double sum turns out to be just one sum of the ai square sigma square, right? We are summing positive terms, so we know that this is positive. All right. So this is an example of kernel where you can prove using directly the de directly using the definition you can prove that uh, the kernel is positive definite. For most kernel, it's not that easy because you've seen this has to be true for all n. So whatever the size of the sum is, whatever these real values are, and whatever the x i you choose in the input space. So if if you were to check that numerically, that that's not possible to do, right? So for most kernel, we can't use directly the definition. And there are other tricks to prove that they are positive definites. Uh, a very common one is uh, Bochner theorem that tells you that a continuous stationary function is positive if and only if it is the Fourier transform of a positive measure. Okay. So for all, positive, uh, for all stationary kernels, we can use this to prove that, or for Maybe not for all, but for most of them, it's kind of easy to use that to prove that they are positive semi-definite. So here's an example on how to use this theorem to create new covariance function. So we take a measure like that. So this is positive. I know if I take the Fourier transform of this quantity, I know the Fourier transform of this. It's uh, the sinc function sine t over t. If I plot this function, I, I obtain this quantity. And I know that I can use that as a stationary covariance function. So I can plug that in my model, and I know it will, it will make sense. So if you look at this function, uh, some people could tend to say, oh, I don't think this is positive semi-definite because some of the values over there, so there's no thing on the y-axis, but the value of 0 is around here. So the kernel takes negative values, OK? But that does not say anything about not being positive semi-definite, right? A kernel can take negative values. It just means that the value of the process uh, between two points that are apart from this distance will be negatively correlated. Okay, so the process will tend to be to be wavy. You will have cycles in the samples of your process. Okay, I'll show you another example later where where we can see that so samples from a GP that are that are wiggly. Uh, OK, so you can take any measure. You compute the Fourier transform and use that as a kernel. So, um, so for example, the Gaussian kernel. So you know that the Fourier transform of the Gaussian bell is the Gaussian bell, right? So it means that since the Gaussian bell is positive, it means that uh, you can use the Gaussian bell as a stationary covariance function. So it has many names depending on, on the community. It can be the, uh, so the Gaussian covariance function, the RBF covariance function, the squared exponential covariance function, the exponentiated quadratic covariance function. It has a many, as many names as there are communities. And um, for other kernels, for example, all the Matern kernels are Fourier transform of a measure that has basically this, this shape. So all Matern kernels, you can use this theorem to prove that they are positive semi-definite functions. OK? So that's uh, the Bochner theorem is a very powerful tool. So you can also use this result to create uh, more kernels. So um, this is from a paper from Andrew Wilson. And um, his idea was to uh, not to work directly with a kernel, but to take a positive measure, he takes his measure to be viewed as a sum of uh, Gaussian bells. Okay, and But the sum of the, the Gaussian bells are not necessarily centered on 0. So it's a sum of Gaussian bells that with some values for the mean, some value for the uh, height of the bell, and some value for, for, the, th for the spread. So um, he takes it symmetric because if it were not to be symmetric, then the Fourier transform would not be real. So he wants his process to be real. So he just take a sum of Gaussian bells and make it symmetric. He knows that taking the Fourier transform of this is kind of, uh, it's not straightforward, but there's nothing difficult in there. It's just uh, shifted Gaussian bells, so it will be a cosine time, uh, time a Gaussian. And 
If you do this, you obtain this kind of kernel. And this kernel is parameterized by the value of the mean, of the height, and of the spread of these Gaussian bells, right? So it's a kernel that is parameterized by its uh, spectral uh, properties. So if you do that, you obtain something. And you know this will be positive, semi-definite. So you can use it to, to sample from it. And this is what I was talking about, where you have a process with that tends to have a periodic behavior, but it's not perfectly periodic. But it's wavy because the value here is negatively correlated with the value here. These two values are positively correlated. So that's why we recover this kind of thing. So this kernel is probably a good kernel if you want, I don't know, to, to approximate. You have waves coming on the shore, and you will measure the height of the waves. You know it's kind of periodic, but not perfectly periodic. So you don't want to plug directly a periodic kernel. but one like that kind of encapsulates this information of the, the way the function can behave. All right? So now I'm going to talk a bit about the choice of, uh, of the kernel. So the predicted mean and the predicted covariance they basically only depend on the kernel if you assume the mean is equal to 0. So if you change just this function, you will end up with two models that are uh, very, very different. It's the same data. It's just to the model are very, very different. Why do we have models that are so different? It's because the prior assumption we, we put on, on, on the function we want to approximate is very different in both cases. In this case, we assume our function to be very regular. And on this one, it's continuous, but it's not differentiable anywhere. So you end up with two very different models. You can't say that one model is better than the other. You can't say, oh, oh, this one has much smaller confidence interval, so I do prefer this model. This model will be great if your function indeed behaves like that, but it will be absolutely terrible if your function behaves like that. If you do so, and then if you compare the predictions of your model with actual values of the function, you will, see, you will observe values that are very far away from your predictions and definitely not in your confidence intervals. So this model will be very bad if the function you approximate is actually like that, whereas this one will be the appropriate one. So don't choose just a model because it's very sure of what's going on. Choose it accordingly to your prior belief on the function to approximate. So when, when, you have to, when you have to build models, it's, it's very easy. You've seen that with, uh, with GPI. It's very easy to you take a model, you take a kernel, you obtain a model. You take another kernel, you'll obtain another model. So the real question is, what kernel should I choose to, to build my model? So um, there's the idea is, since the kernel encode your prior belief, is to put as many information as you can in your kernel. So to be such that the sample pass looks the most like you think your function behaves. So the first thing you can ask is, do I think uh, my, my function can be approximated by something that is stationary? Or do I already know that it goes crazy in some region of the space? So if it is stationary, then you will, of course, choose a stationary kernel. So can, can yeah. you use mixtures for your product? Sorry? Mixtures of, of different types of kernels? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I will come to that uh, a bit later. So is it stationary or not? What can you say about the differentiability? So if it's a computer code, you can ask to the people who know the physics about it. But what do you think about the regularity of this function? Do you really think it's, it's very smooth? Or should I take something that is um, like the Matten covariances that are not infinitely differentiable? Uh, do you expect particular trends? So that's something that you can put either, as Jeremy explained this morning, either you put that in the mean of your process, or you put that into the, into the kernel? Or uh, do you expect some particular patterns, like periodicity, cycles, I, as I was discussing with you know, your approximating waves coming to the shore? Or do you know the function you want to approximate? Is additive, all these kind of things? You should gather all the information you can, and then try to find a kernel that meets all these criteria. So uh, as we've seen, there are uh, parameters into the kernel. So once you've choose the family of kernels, you can use these parameters, tune these parameters, for example, using maximum likelihood. Uh, this is what you've been doing during the lab. Another option is to choose the parameter that will minimize the, the prediction error. 
So, um, so as I was saying, it's very common to try a lot of kernels and then to pick the, the best model. If you want to know what model is, is the best, you have to compare what your model is predicting in some points that you have not used in your training set, so some points that, has n that were not observed when you build the model, and you compare this prediction of the model with the actual value of the, of the function. So you can do that on a test set. So you, take some, you make some extra run of your numerical simulator, for example, and then you compare this prediction with the prediction of your, of your model. Or if you have a limited budget, you can do leave one out. So you just rebuild your model by removing some of the observation points. So you, you train your model, and then you remove one of the points, and then you make a prediction of the point you've just removed. And then you compare the prediction of your model with the actual value. You can do that for all your points. And then you can have an idea of the, of the error. So since our model, uh, they, they do not only predict a mean value. They also give you some confidence interval. So you don't want to test just the mean by making sure the error, the prediction error is small. You also want to make sure that the confidence intervals that are given by your model make sense. So the trick for that is you take the residual you observe, so the difference between the prediction of the model and the value, the actual value, and you divide this by the standard deviation that is predicted by the model. And according to your model, because the model knows there will be some error, and it's already giving you the distribution of the error. So if you divide that by the standard deviation given by the model, you should obtain a variable that, is, uh, that has zero mean and a variance equal to one. Okay, so if you do that for all the points, then you can build an histogram and you compare this, this histogram with uh, uh, n01 distribution, with a standard normal distribution. And depending on if your histogram is okay compared to the theoretical distribution, then you're fine. But you can see sometimes on this graph that your models may be very underconfident or very underconfident about their predictions. So don't forget. It's a good thing to test the mean, but don't forget to test also the confidence intervals. And if you really want to do things properly, your model is also giving you some predicting covariance between two points you're going to observe. So you can also double check that the predicted conditional covariance given by your model is also good on your test data, okay? So the idea really is to, since later we are going to use the confidence intervals, yeah, the idea really is to test everything, and a good model is one that that will be good for these three things. Maybe this one is not as common. It's the good practice to do that. But make sure you do the, the first two one. And another thing that is a good practice in, in modeling is to try some inputs remapping. Because sometimes the phenomenon you're looking at is we are, we are usually, actually, we are usually using stationary kernel. And sometimes the phenomenon you're looking at is non-stationary. But you don't know that beforehand. But if you try some transform, so to one of the input variables, you associate the logarithm of it. And then you use that as, uh, as in your training data. So you just remap one of the inputs. Sometimes that can give you much better model. Okay? So that's something you can try when you're not happy about your model. It, maybe it's because one of these things going on. So try remapping, and maybe it makes more sense. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't matter. You can do that before or after, but it's the thing. It has to be before building your model. Okay, so you take all your input, you just create a new column that is the exponent of the first one, and then you you see what's going on. Yeah, but I can't do the normalization at like zero mean and unit variance. Of the so the normalization of the zero mean and unit variance was a normalization on the prediction on the outputs. So you were looking at. We have observation here. You build your model like that. And you say, OK, now I'm going to take one test point over here. I run. Uh, I look at the actual value of my function here. And it's, you can compute here the error. And you can standardize this error with basically more or less this quantity. Yeah, so when I, when I was thinking about renormalizing, that was in there. Now, the input space, these transformations here are on the input space. Yeah. 
So you just do a remapping and you do another model and you see if this remapping helps or doesn't help. So uh, you can do whatever you want. It does not change much in your model to do the um, to do the rescaling you're talking about about the input because we often have these length scale parameters and these length scale also are a rescaling. So in, it's interesting to do uh, this scaling if you want to compare two length scale together. So you want your variables to be to have the same range of variation. So you can say, oh, this length scale is bigger than than this one, uh, but. But yeah, you, you don't necessarily need to do that. Your model should be the same whether you do or you, you don't do this rescaling of the input. OK? Any other question? I'm not exactly sure about the actual optimizer in GPI, but some of the guy. What's the optimizer in GPI for uh, the optimizer in GPI for the length scale? Yeah, so yeah. So it's more kind of uh, yeah gradient descent. Uh, any other question? OK, so now that we have a clue about how to test a model, we'll see that it's very easy to, to change kernels and to make a lot of modifications. So potentially, we will be able to try many, many, many models and to compare them using, using these. So this is all the kind of transformations you can make on kernel. I know you've tried some of them during, during the lab. So you, if you have two kernels, you can sum them, and you can still use that as, as a kernel. You can also make the product between them, and you will obtain something that is still a kernel. So when I say still a kernel, it means something that is still positive semi-definite. And you can also compose a kernel with a, with a function. So now I'm going to illustrate on various examples how, how this can be used. So this is a data set with the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. So it looks like a function when I plot it like this, but it's actually a lot of observations. You can see here it's we have the data since the 1960, and we have one observation per month. Okay, so that's why I plotted it as a function because we have many many points. All right, but these are just a set with with a lot of points. So now let's say we want to predict the concentration over the next 20 years. So when you look at these data, you can think, oh. I assume this concentration to be uh, to be something that is quite uh, that is quite smooth. So I will take a very regular covariance function, and when I look at it, I can see two things. The first one is these one-year variations. So it happens that the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is higher during summer than it is during during winter. So we have these these little variations around that that have very high frequency because it's a one-year frequency. And we have this large trend, which is something with a much, uh, much, much, much smaller frequency. The fact that this concentration is increasing. So we've seen that the length scale parameter are um, contraction or dilatation of the input space, and that they can allow us to have sample paths with very high frequency or with very low frequency if we take large length scales. So let's try both models. So the one on the left is with a very small length scale. I'm saying. I know that there's some very high frequencies in there because I, I can see them. I can see them on, on the map. So we can see that this prediction is very very bad. Why? Because if it's something that is very high dimension um, with high frequency variations, as soon as I'm not far away from our, from where I was, then I basically lost all correlation with what my observation. So my models, the only thing it does is to come back to the mean value that here I assume to be centered, and uh, but I have a large variance to to represent the fact that all these values are quite high. So here the mean is very bad, but the confidence intervals would be more or less 
OK, but I'm very unhappy about this one. This one I'm very unhappy too, because it does encapsulate, it, it does find the, the large trend, but the prediction over there, the confidence intervals are very wrong. I'm saying that next year I know perfectly what will be going on, but with my eye from using the historic, I, I would expect something with some variations, with the one-year variations inside. So this model is very bad. It's good for the mean, but it's very bad for the confidence interval. So I'm very unhappy about these two. So the thing I can try now is, since I have two types of frequency into my signal, I can sum the two kernels. And if I sum the two kernels, this is the model I can obtain, which is much better than the previous one. Because now the mean is right, because the mean encapsulates the low frequency trend. And the confidence intervals are right, because I know I have some small high frequency variations. And they will, be, they will be in there. So just by taking two kernels and summing them together, I end up with a model that is quite good. If I look at the GP that is behind this kernel, I can see this as the sum of two GP, one with some very large length scale that will give me the trend, and one with small length scale that will give me small variations around, around this trend. And this is actually something that makes sense to approximate this data. Yeah. Um, ah, the, the thing I see here is that uh, so I, I can recover there's a small, uh, uh, the confidence interval are quite small in this region. But, don't, how do you see but the, the so I, I don't say they, they perfectly do the one year period, but I, I know that my samples uh, they are in there and the covariance increases quite, quite fast around here. OK, so my confidence interval, they start from zero. And just after that, they, they already are at this, uh, at this value. So if I'm here, I know that I know very well the GP with the large length scale. Because for large length scale, I know that I'm close from my data. But from the small length scales, I know my variations are in there. OK, so it's a combination between having this confidence interval quite right and uh, increasing rapidly to, to, this, uh, to this threshold. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would have ended up with something quite similar. Yeah, not uh, not exactly the same, but yeah, something similar. Uh, so the thing is, we can do we can do even better because here I'm just talking about uh, trend and small variations around this trend, but. Since I know this periodicity is due to summer and winter, I know that's an exact one year period. So I can include in my model uh, a kernel that accounts for this periodicity. And, uh, and OK, and I can look at that and say, oh, I can see basically here uh, something that could be quadratic. Or maybe an expert can tell me, oh, I think, or I know because the models are built like that, that we have a quadratic trend in this. So I can take another kernel that will have some quadratic components, the small length scale, large length scale, and uh, something periodic on top of that. And then I plug that into, into GPI, and I estimate for all these kernel, I will estimate the variance parameters. You can't see them right there, but I will estimate the variance parameter. I will estimate the length scale of these kernels. And this is what we, we end up with. So a model that is much, much better, because now no, now that we say, uh, so the, the first quadratic term does not change much. But adding the periodicity, the model is very happy to see that because, oh, actually, this periodic kernel can explain very well what's going on in there. So it has to, it has to continue like that. OK, so just by summing kernels together, we are able to specify in our prior dis distribution that I know my thing will be with a one-year period. I know there will be some trend. I know that. With a small range, I will not be exactly periodic. So I'm adding a, sm a small uh, length uh, kernel with small length scale to account for the variations you have each year, more or less, around this trend and period. Um, and the one on the left just saying that there's something quadratic. But I could remove this term. That wouldn't change much in this example. 
Okay, so it's very easy if you have a clue about what's going on or if you observe that on your data, it's very easy to, um, to modify kernels and to, to get much, much better models. So the kernels we had right here were kernels that were defined for the same input variables. Uh, something you can also do is you take two kernels that are defined on two different space, so x1 and x2, and use these two to create a covariance function over the space generated by x1 and x2. Okay, so you use two kernels over one-dimensional space to create a kernel over a two-dimensional space. And this is the way the, the kernel looks. So from a Gaussian process point of view, as before, this kernel, you can see that as the kernel of a GP, that is the sum of two kernels, and these two uh, the sum of two process, sorry, and these two process being the process with this kernel over there. So if you sample from this kernel, we know we can sample because we know the sum of kernel is still a kernel. So I can plug that into, into a GP sampler. And uh, this is the sample I obtain. And if you look at this sample, they have something a bit specific. And this is uh, samples that are additive functions too. So that's, of course, very useful if you want to approximate a function that is, that is additive. That's also useful if you want to approximate a function that, is, that has an additive component plus something that is not additive. Then you just have to take the kernel above and sum that with a regular kernel, for example. But that's a way to put some information in your model by saying, I know there's some strong additive component, so I'm going to give you an additive kernel to, to account for this. And uh, it's also interesting to uh, creating models in high dimensional spaces. Uh, some of you are probably familiar with the GAM models, the generalized additive models, that are very popular in high dimension because they do not suffer the curse of dimensionality. So you can use, you can use this if you have high dimensional input space. So let's see what happens on, on a simple example. I take here a function that is additive. I can write my function here as a function of x1 plus another function of, of x2. This is the way my, my test function looks. And I have 20 observation points for, uh, for building my Gaussian process regression model. And this is what I obtain. So here I take a, a classic uh, Gaussian kernel. And uh, the model is quite bad. It does not look like the, the test function we, we had. So the root mean square error is, is quite high. And the model we obtain with the additive kernel is much, much, much better because we are giving a lot of information to our model by saying, I have these observations, and I know that this function is, is additive. OK, so once again, choosing the right kernel structure is very helpful to obtain a good model. Uh, so the model you obtain, it's straightforward to show that it's also an additive function. Uh, if I write my model and I just specify that my kernel here is a sum, this one being a function of x1, this one being a function of, of x2, then I can expand my product and obtain this sum. And this can be seen as a model with respect to just the first variable, and this one um, a model with respect to the second variable. And these two can be interpreted also as conditional expectation. The first model is the conditional expectation of the first process given that we have observed the sum of two processes. So here, what's happening in the second dimension kind of appears like observation noise. So my prediction in this direction is a bit corrupted by the fact that I've observed it, but I've not only observed this process, I've observed it corrupted by something else. OK? So now if we look at the prediction variance, so this is a contour plot of the prediction variance for, uh, for a usual uh, RBF kernel, so a, a usual Gaussian kernel. So you can see that the variance is equal to 0 around, or small and equal to 0 at the observation points. And then it increases when you go away, when you go far apart from the observation points. And here you reach kind of a, a constant value that is the variance of your prior distribution. Now, if you look at what's going on for the additive kernel, it turns out that there are some regions of the space that have a ver small variance, even if there's no points in this, in this area. Do, do you know how this can be explained? Would you have a clue? Just in a standard way, 
um, the, the kit of information about the prior that explains all this. Yeah. And they also explain the same stuff in the empty space as well. Yeah, exactly. The thing is, if here I'm, my prior is that my function is is additive. And if your function is additive, if you know the value on these three points, that are three corners of a rectangle, then you know the value over there. You know the value over there will be this value plus this value minus this value. That's true for all additive functions. So you have variance that decreases at this point just because it is kind of the corner, it's the fourth corner of this a rectangle with based on these three points. Okay, so you can observe this type of, of phenomenon. So your model will be much more correct. So now if you use this to create some design of experiments, you can see that if you observe the value just on the axis, then your model over the wall space will, be, uh, will have zero variances in, in all these points on the grid. So here we recover the fact that with a linear number, with a number of observations that increases linearly with the dimension, then you can cover the space if you know that your function you want to approximate is additive. So these design of experiment would be, uh, that's if I, no, I don't have the picture. These design of experiment would be very bad because if my function turn out not to be additive, if I realize that later, I have absolutely no observations in there, so that's not, that's not good. But he, I could also have a design that fills the space much better, but that do not have uh, that still retains this property. For example, if I were to move these points over here, my prediction variance would not change because uh, the value in here would be known because I would have these three uh, observations at the top, at the corners of my rectangle. So, um, so yeah, this design could be changed in order to fill the space a bit better in case we realize our function is not additive but still knowing very well the, the function everywhere, OK? So I've been talking with the sum of kernels. Now we'll see we can make the product of, of kernel. Um, so if you take two kernels defined over the same space, then you obtain something that is still positive definite. The squared exponential kernel is positive definite. A cosine function, so cosine x minus y, is also something that is positive definite, positive semi-definite. So if I multiply these two, I obtain that. So I can use that into my, my models. Uh, you can make the product of two kernels that are defined over different dimensions. Uh, another example with the squared exponential kernel is the product of two squared exponential kernels in two different directions will give you something that is still a squared exponential kernel in uh, over the, the tensor space. So yeah, you can also multiply two kernels of that, of course, different covariance function. You could take it exponential in one direction and a matern in the other direction if you want, right? You don't have to multiply the same kernels. And, uh, and another thing is that you can make the composition with, with a function. So if, you're, if, you, if k is a kernel, then for any function f, you, this quantity will be, will be positive definite. And this quantity can be interpreted as the covariance of a process that is defined as z1 and with a remapping of the, of the inputs. Okay, so that can be seen as a nonlinear rescaling of the, of the input space, as we were discussing before. So this is what you can obtain, for example, for your samples. If you know you're strongly um, non-stationary because you have some crazy variations in zero, and then your process is smoother and smoother, you can use this remapping, and this is the way your, your sample will, will look. So of course, all the transformation we've seen can be, can be combined. So for example, could you tell me why the function up there is is a valid kernel. What operations have I been doing to obtain that? What? Uh, why is that a valid covariance structure? What operation have I been combining? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly that. So I have, 
we know that uh, k of x y equal x y. This is the linear kernel. Then I apply a remapping to this kernel. So this is positive definite. I know that I can apply a remapping to this kernel. This is still positive definite. And I can multiply that by another kernel. OK? So you, you can, of course, use all these together and obtain something something like that. So this will be your new kernel, and this will be your sample path. Yeah? Can you use different types for the x and the y? Uh, no, you can't. Then you will use the positive definiteness. Remember that a kernel has to be symmetric. OK, so. Yeah. So for me, and like, I learned to model like kind of interpretation where I add covariance functions together because it means that my model is kind of vicious and keeps comparing to a linear trend or a curvy trend or something else. Yeah. So if you multiply the numbers together, what would the equivalent be in terms of the model of how you model the f of x? Uh, interpretation? No, no, no. It's it's much more tricky to to interpret these. Uh, because the, the thing is, if you if you do the sum of two GPs, you still have a GPs, all right? If you do the product of two GPs, you don't have a GP anymore. But the covariance, the product covariance, is the covariance of the product of two GP, which is not a GP. And then we reuse that as the covariance uh, of a GP. Okay, so it's not straightforward to 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 interpret what's going on, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's the same for me. I, I know I can do it, but uh, yeah, you you really need a good reason to, to to do that. Yeah. Could an example be this one over x, where you have different degrees of uh, wickedness in the beginning of the range yeah. towards the end? Could this be an example of where when uh, multiplying kernels could be useful? So because this is what you did there, right? So you yeah. have one over x, and you have things which are more. Very more towards the beginning of the range. Yeah. The end. yeah. 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 So the um, maybe with this particular kernel, actually, this can be interpreted as uh, f of x uh, square can be interpreted as the variance of your process. So maybe you're right. Maybe for this one, we can give it some meaning to to what we are doing. And we indeed have a process with a very large variance here that will tend towards infinity, and then that decays. So for this particular case, yeah, that's just having a non, before we did a non-stationary rescaling of the input, and here we are doing a, a non-linear rescaling of the outputs. Okay, so in this case, we can interpret it, for example. I'm assuming there's some restrictions of the function, right? That the function is a function, which is just a constant or a zero. Yeah, you can take any function. Any function, yeah. There's no, it can be negative, it can be whatever you want. There's no restriction in here. Uh, OK, so maybe I, I, I will skip this because I don't want to finish too late. And I will just talk a bit about this, uh, this application. So um, this is something I was working on when I was uh, doing my postdoc here. And we finally got it published this year. So that was uh, three years ago. It's a bit old, but it has been published a few months ago. Um, so we have some observations. And we know there's some periodicity in there. And we want to extract this periodic component of, of our signal. So the idea is to assume to, to see our, our GP as a sum of something periodic plus something that is not periodic at all. So something, if you project that onto uh, a, a base of sines and cosine. You project that onto the Fourier basis, and you will you must obtain zero. So in, in the work we did, we proved that if you take uh, if you take any usual kernel, uh, then you can extract its periodic component and the orthogonal of its periodic component. So the periodic com component would write like that, like a product 
between your basis functions, the inverse of the matrix, and your basis functions again. And the orthogonal of this, so something that would be independent to your periodic component, writes, writes this way. So now if you plug that into your model, so you can take, for example, you take a Matten kernel, and if you, as before, you can split your models into two quantities, one that will be periodic and another one that be at aperiodic. And since these can be interpreted as conditional expectations, then we also have conditional uh, variances for our submodels. So this is what we obtain on this uh, thing. We have here a fit with a matern kernel. And I write these as a sum of two things. The first one is the periodic component of what's going on in there. And the second one is the non-periodic component. So these can be improved by looking at the periodic, the, at looking at the, the length scale and the variance of the periodic component and the aperiodic component as two independent things. And I can say, OK, no, now that I have these two kernels, I will tune their parameters independently. So I will not put any tie on these two parameters. So if we do that, uh, we increase the number of parameters we have in our model. You can also add uh, the frequency a frequency parameter on your basis when you say, oh, I'm not sure about the period I'm going to observe. I, so I add another parameter. So here you, we have a new kernel that is parameterized by one, two, three, four, and five parameters. And if we do that, this is the model we obtain with a periodic uh, component that is very confident about what's going on, and then the linear trend that is recovered. And this is exactly the function I started, the function I used to, to create this data. That was a sine plus a, plus a linear function. OK, so what the model, we give more degrees of freedom to the model by setting these parameters independently. And you can recover that, oh, OK, I'm, there's a very long length scale in this direction because I see something that is very linear. And, uh, and in this one, so probably here with the large variance, in this one, it will tune the parameters independently. And then you can get, by giving the model these degrees of freedom, you kind of make a, an assumption that is not as strong about the way you think your function behaves, because you're in a class of function that is much bigger, because you can tune all these independently. And yeah, you end up with a, with a good model. And uh, so we applied that to, uh, to some data that was related to the study of the circadian rhythm. So the idea is to collect. So the data is from Edward's paper in 2006. The idea was to measure the activity of all the genes of Arabidopsis over, uh, I think it was 48 hours, something like that, and to make a measurement every four hours of the activity of, of each gene. And um, the question was, among all the genes that have been sequenced and using the 30 time points, can I pick the one that behave periodically? And this is, this is what we obtain uh, in here. So um, we compare our results with the results from the original paper. So he was choosing 1,000 something uh, genes, saying these are the ones that behave in a periodic fashion. And uh, what I'm plotting here are the genes that he has selected as periodic and we haven't, and the one we selected as periodic and he hasn't. Okay, so it's kind of the genes on which the two methods disagree. So according to our methods, these genes are still kind of periodic, but there's something on top. For example, for these two ones, there's some, there's some noise on top of the periodic component. For this one, there's a linear trend, and for this one, there's it is something kind of a cycle, but it's not perfectly periodic either. So um, if we look at the ranking, these were not far from the genes we, we selected. And uh, if, if we look at the one we selected that were not in the, in the original paper, this is, what we, this is what we have. So genes with very strong spikes that like firing at every 24 hours. OK, so we are very happy when we had, when we had these results because we were able to, to get new ones with a yeah, very sharp components. Uh, as a conclusion, so the kernels, they have a huge impact on the model. So you really have to be careful about when you choose your kernel, you should try to get the more information as possible about what you want to approximate and to choose a kernel that satisfies all these. 
I really encourage you to uh, try lots of kernel within still testing things reasonable with the information you have. But try many kernels, compare the prediction errors, and so on. And, and yeah, that you will end up with, uh, with good models. And don't forget to test both the mean values, the confidence intervals. So um, yeah. Uh, and last thing is that it's very easy to make new kernels. So either by summing, making the product, or making compositions with function, or as I show in the, in the example, by taking an actual kernel, and then you break it in two parts, and then you tune these parts independently. That's also an interesting thing to do. And uh, the thing I have not discussed is uh, about the linear operator. So for example, if you know your function is symmetric, it's possible to tell that to, to, your, to your model and to build a kernel that will encapsulate this, this information. And that's all. There's a few references there, but do you have any questions? Yeah. So many tools were troubled because there's now this thing nowadays to send you on transactions to this filter. Yeah, so, sorry, can you speak a bit louder? <laughs> and many tools where people are doing feature based analysis, there's now this idea of feature induction that you don't have to hand pick your features anymore. Yeah. Your model is essentially learning them. Was yeah. the same kind of idea that exists for kernels where you have to learn your kernel instead of hand designing it? So it's, uh, y y you can a bit retrieve that in, in the kernels we are using. If, if you do a sum of kernels, and if you estimate the variance parameters using maximum likelihood, you will see that maximum likelihood can turn off some of the kernel and will turn on some other ones. So you can retrieve kind of these principles, but you have to give your model kind of the, the, the bricks that you want to use in your construction. But yeah, there's still this degree of freedom of, of choosing the bricks the model want, want to use. And it can turn off some of them if they are not interesting. Probably worth mentioning, I always forget to include it in the slide somewhere, but this project at Cambridge, the automatic yeah. statistician, is doing that in an explorative way. So it tries to, it has some building blocks for kernels that it sticks together, and it has a way of searching through those kernels using BIC, which somehow I don't think is valid because it's not independent, but anyway, it seems to vaguely work. And I think they've got Bayesian methods. So if you look up this project, automatic statistician, it's basically yeah. doing exactly that sort of feature analysis. And it's a really nice exploitation. And then the key aspect of it is once they've done that, they turn that into an English report. So they associate words with each covariance function, and they create a report that says, oh, the trend is linear over this period, and then it has a dis you know, whatever. It's a nice project. Yeah. Just ask, yeah. Uh, does Gaussian, you talked about GANs having, not having the dimension, cursor dimensionality. Yeah. Does, is it the same thing with Gaussian processes? They don't have the cursor. Yeah, the, the, it, it depends on the covariance function you choose. If you have an additive one, then you don't have these. If you have uh, the usual covariances, they do. So the thing is, uh, with the usual stationary covariances, one, one point, one observation, only has an influence on its neighborhood. And we know that if you want to cover the space, when the dimension increases, you need more and more points to, to cover it, and this increases yeah, exponentially. So it's just because usual covariance are based on neighborhoods that you only influence the observations only influence the neighborhood. For additive covariances, one point influences even the point that are very far away along along the axis. So that's why you you don't have this issue. So the, what, what's the what's the problem with uh, GP? You know, not a lot of people use them. Um, what's the restriction? So the limitations would be uh, can be computational. You have to store and inverse the covariance matrix that has the size of your observations. Right. So if you do the basic JPs, you will start experiencing problems around 1,000 to 10,000 observations. Then your computer will start to, to complain. Uh, actually, it complains about storing the covariance matrix before inverting it. Like the storage in n square is a problem before the inversion that is in n cube. And providing us an additive model, teaching people do whatever you like. What? Providing us an additive model, the number of variables that you have can be anything. anything. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you can have quite a lot uh, of variables. But you need your additivity assumption to make sense. Otherwise, your model will, will be very fooled. People do actually do, even then, without additive models, people will apply Gaussian processes to values of P, which are across whole images, so thousands. But, um, 
Yeah, yeah. So you, yeah have problems, uh, you, you tend to have larger length scales than you might otherwise expect. Yeah. Because because locally, locally the data probably lies on a lower dimensional manifold. So the distances don't expand in the way that you might expect if you look at it. They're not independent features. If the features are correlated, the effective distances are smaller. So that's why they seem to work. But um, yeah, it, it, there can be problems. So for example, some tricks people use are compact support covariance functions, right? So compact support covariance functions to make things go faster give you a sparse covariance matrix. But when you increase the dimensionality, compact support covariance functions just don't work at all. So they'll work up to two or three, four dimensions, you get a sparse covariance. But when you do very high dimensions, it's non-sparse because the length scale to be large enough for anything to be there is basically everything becomes interconnected. Um, yeah, so, so the limitation is really about the number of observations. It's not about the dimension of the inputs. Okay, The complexity does not depend on the dimension of the inputs. But still, there are some problem repairing that are not numerical problems, but problem repairing when you have a very large number of of you see people using Gaussian processes a lot is in things like the example that Nicola gave, um, where those are noisy time series of relatively short length. Yeah. So how many were there? I can't remember in that example. Uh, 13, I think. 39 data points, and you're trying to find a periodic signal in that. That's sort of outside the traditional domain of signal processing. In yeah. a signal processing, they would sample it to death, one gigahertz sample rating, and then they would do a big Fourier analysis, get a spectrum out. Well, you can't do that in these cases because they're gene expression experiments. So sometimes every data point's a dead mouse. So a billion dead mice is not really very practical. And, and also they're noisy. So, so in these domains, you get a lot of these domains in, in, in computational biology. And, and then you really want to take account of the uncertainty in the measurements and get the maximum value of each data point. And of course, 39 data points, the covariance function is no problem for a modern computer. And you can do it across 30,000 genes in, I don't know, how long does it take? A couple of hours, it's just, yeah. I mean, so it's, a, it's much more efficient. So that's the domain. Whenever you see like shorter time series with noise, you should be really thinking Gaussian process territory. If it's like one gigahertz sample time series, then uh, call the signal processing engine. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Any other question? Yeah. Say you work with some data set which is quite high dimensional. Okay, so there's maybe to answer uh, your your question. There's w one thing for when you do some linear regression, it's quite a straightforward to you look at the parameter you estimate and you say, oh, okay, it means it's increasing in its dimension, or if the parameter is very small, you say, oh, this variable has no influence on the output. And with GPs, you can't really do that because your model is a combination of basis function, but that are that just have a local influence. So it's very difficult when you fit a model to, it's not very difficult, but it's not out of the box, you don't have the effect of the various variable. You can look at the length scale and decide, oh, this length scale is very large. There's probably nothing going out in, in this direction. But then you, m you need tools such as sensitivity, an sensitivity analysis or the, this kind of thing to try to understand what is the structure inside your model and if you can remove some of the variables, if some of them seem more influenced than others and, and so on. Does that answer your... Um, I don't know. My guess would be to try to do everything and see what what works best. <laughs> no, that, that depends too much on your uh, on your data. Yeah. So if it's a one-dimensional time series, a lot of these combination of covariance functions, it's going to be quite easy to start looking at residuals and things like that and play with that. In higher dimensional cases, I think it's fair to say you see much less combinations yeah. of covariance functions because it's much harder to tell what's going on. So this ARD covariance function or the sensitivity where you have a scale associated with input is quite commonly used for regression. But as Nicolas says, you have to be a bit cautious because 
you can downscale a dimension. It doesn't mean it has no influence. Sometimes it means that influence is vaguely linear. So you have to be a bit careful with interpretation, do mm. some sensitivity analysis. Um, I don't know what else. People for higher dimensions, they tend to use this uh, the Gaussian kernel, this exponentiated quadratic thing that I showed. Um, and for lower dimensions, more these return family of covariance functions. Yeah. And the reason for that is as follows, that the, the problems of this exponential quadratic, this very smooth kernel, don't tend to turn up in high dimensions because the problems occur when you're getting data points, you get problems when you get data points very close together because it makes a very strong assumption about infinite smoothness. Yeah. I think you touched on it, and I wasn't yeah. always paying attention. You normally touch on it. Um, and, but the problem is you don't, with the high dimensional data, you really can't see what the derivatives are, right? Because the data is in such high dimensions that derivatives aren't very well defined. In one dimensional data, that really comes through clearly when you get a lot of sampling of data nearby. The derivative has become very well determined, and the exponentiated quadratic covariance function can really fail quite badly. So in high dimensions, you tend to use it because it's faster to compute than these matern class of covariances. Um, but in lower dimensions, be careful to include something that uh, um, is, doesn't make quite such a strong assumption about the smoothness because it's making that bell-shaped curve assumption in the in the Fourier spectrum, which is uh, actually quite a smooth assumption. It's uh, sort of knocking off high frequencies. Uh, the, the tails are going down very rapidly. Whereas these matern class, they've got these student T forms, so they believe in higher frequencies. So that's the sort of choice people instinct on, on this point. Uh, is it also the case that uh, in higher dimensions, uh, the higher smoothness of the quadratic exponential make up for the data which are sparse anyway? So you're imposing more structure because your data are sparser anyway? Yeah, maybe, quite possibly. It may be a better idea. That's an interesting point. I haven't seen anything that explores that directly. Mm -hmm. So it may be that it's better. It would be nice to see a bit of a study. Yeah, I think it's related to what you were saying before, with the length scale tend to be very large in high dimension, and we tend to fit things that are very smooth, because, because you can, because you have very few points covering the space, so you can have something very smooth with very large length scale that goes along the wall space. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point. The interest, fortunately, there's not a lot of empirical, these type of questions are really important to the practitioner, and no one accepts papers that just sort of explore them. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, reduce the dimensionality first. Yeah, that's a common, I think that's a really common thing and a good idea. And one of the things you can actually do is try and do that in tandem with your Gaussian process fit as well. So a typical thing you might do, a very classical thing, is to first do a principal component analysis, project down to the major components, and then fit your Gaussian process in that space. But actually, that's just a linear reprojection of your data onto a lower dimensional thing, and you can substitute it directly into the covariance function. So uh, there was work by Vivarelli and Williams suggesting learning that as part of the fitting process a long time ago. And just recently, I can't remember, someone else reproposed that, you know, as you do every 15 years. Um, so that's, that can be a good idea. With linear dimensionality reduction, it's straightforward. For nonlinear dimensionality reduction, it can be a little bit harder because you've got to map through the nonlinearity and then into the another Gaussian process. And that's what we try and do with deep Gaussian processes. Um, but it's, um, then you get some challenges with uh, the fit and uh, everything else. So uh, I think it's very sensible, yeah, to do a dimensionality reduction first and try and get some. Yeah, but as you said, that should be done at the same time. Otherwise, you may, even if there's few variations in one direction on the inputs, it doesn't mean that the y does not change in that dimension. So. Yeah, something that um, I remember. Uh, uh, Radford Neal proposing doing, which worked very well, although I think he was using Bayesian neural networks, was to do a uh, rotate along the principal components of the data and then do a feature selection, present the principal components and then do a feature selection along the principal components. Mm. So people try these various things. It's going to be very data set and specific. Mm. Um, yeah, so that you're all. Tired by this time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, maybe we just thank Nicola again for. Thanks. Can I just check before?
before we break, is there any questions about overall organisation, what's happening tomorrow, things that we haven't made clear, what's happening tonight with the brewery trip? Any questions about that? So the brewery trip would stay here for 40 minutes? Yeah, they actually, officially they'll close this building at 6, so in theory none of you are supposed to be in here past 6. Um, but actually, when are you going to leave and where will you meet? Uh, I think we should leave around 6, uh, but if you, you want to go to the hotel, maybe what we can do is we uh, okay, the, main, the main entrance of the building, so we can go from there at 6. So, so the one, it's just straight down. We're actually, I know we went in and then we came out. We're actually directly over that entrance now. So if you meet at that entrance, uh, yeah. At uh, around six, then um, go from there. Okay, thanks very much. Is, is there any, is there any the gain from doing Gilbert uh, Spaces looking at the electric theory of Gilbert Spaces? Uh, or do you, can you just take the results? Do you think the you, you can just take the result if you want. So I, I really like this point of view. I think it's very interesting. I just remove all the slides I have from this, not to not to confuse people. But it's it's very interesting to. For me, it's very helpful. For example, I couldn't do the thing I was showing with the um, periodic kernels. Yeah. In the end, yeah. I until very recently I was not able to do that without uh, the RKHS. S the reproducing kernel in that space right, right. framework. So, so for me, it's the the name is terrible, but the space yeah. behind are very nice. Right. So, uh, so I, I like this framework to work and uh, to do some research. And then what I have, I try to interpret that as Gaussian process conditioning and all these kind of thing. But yeah, quite often I first uh, do things with the RKHS and then uh, and then try to find the equivalent with GPs. But uh, yeah, you, you don't have to if you don't want, but, uh, but I think it's a, it's a very nice point of view, yeah, to, to look at this. Hi. So, potentially we have an optimization problem yeah. over all possible kernels and all possible combinations of these kernels. Yeah. So, do people actually do that? Like, do they optimize for a particular data set? Um, yeah, some people do that, but I, I don't know their I don't know their work. Uh.